When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging, because we are in a remote place here. He replied, You give them something to eat. They answered, We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. About 5,000 men were there. But he said to his disciples, Make them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. Good evening, everyone. How's it going? I'm Tim. Uh, I'm wearing a shirt and I've had a haircut, which must mean that I'm preaching tonight. And uh, what am I speaking on? Well, it's just from that passage that we've just had read. This is a meal. This is the series, semi-series that are win as we think about meals with Jesus, food for the soul. And it's a meal so famous that it has a name. This is called the feeding of the 5,000. I'm sure you've heard it. It's a Sunday school classic. Uh, but it's actually not just 5,000 people. That, as the way they counted in those days, was 5,000 men. So it's actually families that they would count in. So what, this is 20,000 people, 15,000, that Jesus is ministering to in this uh, passage from Luke's Gospel. It's reckoned that this is the largest crowd that Jesus ever ministered to. So this isn't just a meal that happens as we read this story tonight. It is a miracle It is a miracle meal where one young boy's food is multiplied enough to become food for thousands and thousands of people. It's a miracle. Um, But at various points throughout church history, people have tried to explain away the supernatural bit of this story. So they'll say things like, well, maybe Jesus had food hidden in a cave. Um, Or actually, that everyone in the story, well, they all had secret picnics. You know, those secret picnics that first century Israelites had. Um, Although, and this is my favorite, the real miracle was in people's hearts as they learned to share. Um, if we take the account seriously for what it is, we take it on face value, it is a miracle. And it's a miracle that tells us primarily about the one who did it. This passage today, I mean, this is a dead giveaway, of, isn't it? This passage tells us about Jesus. The Bible always tells us about Jesus. I know that. But this miracle tells us about what he is like. It tells us about who he is and about what he does. I love how Tim Chester, the author of A Meal with Jesus, which is a book I'd highly recommend, he puts it like this. Jesus is known through his catering, which I like. This meal tells us about Jesus. So why don't we pray together and let's pray that Jesus will be revealed tonight. Let's pray, shall we? God, thank you for this chance to be here tonight together. And we pray that as we unpack your word, you would speak to us. Jesus would learn more about you. And we pray that you would be revealed in this meal. Amen. Amen. So as we read this kind of passage, what do we learn about Jesus? Well, the first thing we might think about is that we learn about his character, the character of Jesus. Let's read verse 10 again, shall we? It's going to come up on the screen. You can read along in your Bible. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they'd done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and healed those who needed healing. And the key thing to note here um, is that Jesus was taking the lads, the disciples, on a retreat, essentially. And they've been ministering, and Jesus just sent them out earlier in Luke 9 to go travel all about the place, and to heal, and to preach, and to do all the things that he's been doing. And you'd see this in Jesus' ministry. He'd spend time with people, and he would retreat. And he'd spend time with people, and he'd retreat. And that's what they're all doing together at this point. And I don't know much about the place of Bethsaida. It's right by the Lake of Galilee. Maybe there are great views. There's a great couple of hotels, some nice spa rooms. You know, the lads are going on a break. But the people find out. The crowd finds out where Jesus is going. And I get it, probably like a mob, you know, they mob him. They find out where he's going. And there must have been so many people, overwhelming amounts of people. But what do you notice about Jesus' reaction? Despite tiredness, despite the fact that they'd probably been ministering to thousands of people already just in the past few weeks, Verse 11 again, he welcomed them and spoke to them 
about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. In this moment, moved with compassion, Jesus welcomes the crowd. He welcomes them, speaks to them, heals them, feeds them. You see, this, this feeding, this meal, reveals his compassion. Can you see his compassion? The way he welcomes them. He doesn't say, sorry, I'm too tired. That's what I would do. I mean, have you ever been so tired that you don't ever deal with people? No, of course you haven't, because you're all really holy. Jesus is amazing. He welcomes them. This tells us about Jesus' character. I hope you can see that. But also, this meal, this feeding, tells us about Jesus' mission. Because our passage today is a fulfillment of what Jesus declared was happening, was arriving, was coming in his ministry. So he said in Luke 6, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Now as we'll come to this promise of being fed, of being satisfied, that has a deeper meaning. Um, But in Jesus' mission, it, it had a really literal one. Jesus came to minister to the poor and to the hungry, and to meet their needs. So if we look at verse 17, it says, they all ate and were satisfied. They all ate and were satisfied. There's so much food, there's food left over. And it's been remarked that Luke's gospel especially highlights and emphasizes Jesus' ministry to the poor. Now Jesus came to minister to all kinds of people, rich and poor, and everyone in between. But he came for especially those that society might overlook. And that was part of his mission. And we see that displayed here in this story. I want to ask you tonight, are you aware not only of Jesus' compassion for you and his welcome for you, which he has, but also the way that he wants to send you out to minister to the same kind of people that he, he met? How do you serve people who don't have very much? How are you giving away what you have and God has given you? How are you serving the poor? We don't call them the poor these days. We say things like economically disadvantaged or something. But Jesus called them the poor. How are you meeting their needs? And how crucially are you sharing the good news of the kingdom? Because that's what Jesus came to do in his mission. And this real meal reveals his mission and his character. But there's something more here, I think, that's right at the heart of what this passage is about. See, our passage today comes in the middle of two questions about Jesus' identity, as in who he is. So in verse 9 of chapter 9, King Herod, when he's hearing accounts about what Jesus has been doing, he asks this question, who then is this I hear such things about? Who then is this I hear such things about? And then just after our passage, Jesus asked Peter, his disciple, but what about you who asked? Peter, who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. So our passage today is in the middle of these two questions. You could say that our passage about a meal is sandwiched between them. Uh, Good stuff. Uh, So Herod asks who Jesus is. Who is this then? And if you like, Peter, led by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Spirit, says you are God's Messiah. Now, that language of Messiah is the language that the people of God, the Israelites, gave to the one that they were hoping, they were expecting for, to come and redeem them and to save the world. And Peter answers Herod's question. But if you like, our passage, this feeding of the 5,000, also answers Herod's question. Who is this Jesus? And we see that in what our meal points to, this meal points back to. And this meal has references to two Old Testament characters, Elijah and Moses. And the story of Elijah, you can read about this in 2 Kings 4. Elijah feeds 100 men with 20 barley loaves. He even sends his servants to do it, just as Jesus does it. But then this story of the feeding of the 5,000 also points back to Moses and the story of the Israelites being fed with manna in the desert. And when we read the story, maybe as Ashley was reading it earlier, those probably aren't the things that came to mind. You think, ah, oh, yes, Elijah, that's what I think of. Or, ah, oh, yes, Moses. But as Jesus is enacting this, what he's doing is pointing to the fact that he is the Messiah. He's like a new Elijah who's come to feed the people of God. He is a new Moses who's about to lead an exodus for people out of slavery. That's what Tim Chester means when he says about Jesus being known in his catering Jesus is pointing to who he is. But there's another illusion here. The feeding of the 5,000 doesn't just point backwards, it points forwards. Let's consider these two verses 
from verses 11 and 17. They're very slight, they're very small. But Jesus welcomes the crowd, he welcomed them, and they all ate and were satisfied. And in this welcome of the crowd and in this satisfaction that they have, we don't just see meals that happened, but this is a sign of a meal and specifically a banquet that is to come. So do you remember that Jesus, I've done this before, Jago, I'm so sorry. Do you remember when Jago, (laughs) that's happened too many times, Jago preached on this a few weeks ago from Isaiah 25. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that one day on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. And this is referred to what this is what is referred to as the messianic banquet. In other words, God's promise to his people that at the end of all things, at the union of God's people and God himself, there would be a rich and fulfilling banquet with the best wine and meats, rich food for all peoples. And we spoke about a church, being a church that extends this kind of welcome to people, and especially this welcome in Isaiah 55. Do you remember these verses? Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. And the feeding of the 5,000 is an echo of that kind of welcome. Come, all who are thirsty. It's a sign towards this kind of feast, this banquet that is gonna happen with Jesus at the head of the table. He's the host of the party. Just as Jesus is the host of this meal in the desert, so he is gonna be the host of God's banquet that truly satisfies at the end of all things. This is the welcome of God. Come and find satisfaction in Jesus Christ. Not the kind of fleeting satisfaction that the world offers, but true and lasting satisfaction. And Jesus has the power to feed those who seek him through faith. And this feeding, this is a sign that he is the son of God. This meal doesn't just reveal his character, although it does. It doesn't just reveal his mission, although it does. It tells us who he is. He's God's Messiah, sent by God to welcome people who will trust in him to God's banquet that is to come. Now, at this point, Hopefully that feels emotionally satisfying to you. We just had sort of three points. And maybe we could end the sermon there. But I want us to think about what the disciples are like. We thought about what Jesus is like. But what are the disciples like? What's their role in this very famous story? Because I wonder if we might end up being like the disciples. Because even when we know that that's true, you might hear me speaking about Jesus being the Son of God. You'd call yourself a Christian. You think, yes, Tim, I believe that. Amen. But I wonder, even if when we know that, we know it in our head, it's possible to not live like that is true. We can be just like the disciples. Let's read verse 12. So imagine the scene. They've gone to retreat, and then all these crowds have come. Jesus is ministering. Verse 12. Late in the afternoon, the 12 came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. Now, the first thing to note is that they've just told God what to do. Have you ever done that? God, here's the plan. Here's what's going to happen. I've got a bright idea. They've just come to Jesus. Lord, it's it's dark. It's it's getting late. There's no food here. We need to send the people away. Uh, Just the start of the verse 12 says it's late in the afternoon, and the Greek carries a sense of they've been ministering in the day, but now the day is drawing to an end. And um, I always think it's helpful to do this with the Gospels. We're just going to place ourselves in the story. I want you to imagine, first of all, because this is what it would have been like with Jesus. I just want to imagine, first of all, that we've invited Jesus Christ to go with me to be our speaker at Tri-Church Sunday, okay? Jesus Christ, Son of God. I mean, that would look great for the advertising, wouldn't it? Come to church. Who are you going to hear? Literally God, okay? Okay, well, this is what it was like with Jesus. So many people came here. This church would be totally, totally full, and with the way Jesus ministered, it, you know, things tended to go on. There's so many people. So, you know, we team up. Jesus, great. 11.15 service, nice and punchy, evangelistic. Those stories that you do, we love that. More of that, okay? Got it? Wrapped up, 25 minutes, okay? Not a second longer. Sounds like Jago talking to me. 
11.15, okay, at some point he starts preaching. 12 o'clock comes, he's still going. 1 o'clock comes, he's still going. 2 o'clock comes, everyone's chickens in their ovens that are going to have a roast dinner are starting to look rather black at this point. 3 p.m. comes, he's doing his fifth call for prayer ministry. 4 p.m. comes, Jago's really, really struggling at this point. 5 p.m. comes, 6 p.m. comes, Jago, Jesus is on his, Jago and Jesus, I did it again. <laughs> Uh, um, 6 p.m. comes, Jesus is on his 17th call for prayer ministry. Now, if that were happening, the staff team here, well, firstly, we'd all be on WhatsApp, because that's what we do sometimes. Who does this guy think he is? We're going to have to wrap this up. Tim, go up there and pull him off the stage. Maybe we'd be actually back in the foyer. We'd be chatting to each other. What are we going to do? We need to go. That's exactly what it was like for the disciples. It's late in the afternoon, they they see Jesus ministering and ministering and ministering, and they start working out, they're looking around, looking at the time, they look, I mean, it says they're in a remote place here, maybe they could see the sun setting over the Sea of Galilee, and they start to look around at the massive number of crowd, they're sort of counting them up, and then they look, hang on, how are we going to feed any of them? What are we going to do? So here's what I imagine happened. So they decided to get a committee together and have a chat, okay? Because that's what we'd do here. So this is what I imagine the disciples would do. And maybe they were talking with each other and they're saying, God, it's getting late, isn't it? Tell you what, I am starving. I'm starving. If I don't get food soon, I'm going to starve to death. And then one of them says, maybe it was Peter, starve to death. Perfect, I've got it. We're going to go tell Jesus that the people are hungry because he seems to care about the people. He seems to have forgotten about us, but he'll listen to us if we talk to him about the people. And they go, Jesus, they go up to him and maybe Jesus was speaking to the crowd. So you can imagine it, massive crowd and they have to go to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, sorry, sorry everyone. Jesus, 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 come, Jesus, come. So me and the lads, can we just say, we love, the first thing we want to say is we just love this, this whole sermon series that you're bringing in one afternoon. Mm. (laughs) That is so good. And, you know, we could go all night, Jesus. Um, But the problem is the people, the people are hungry, Jesus. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the time. Do you ever watch... um, (laughs) The people, Jesus, they're hungry. And, um, you know, well, I wonder what they imagined Jesus would say at this point. Yeah, lads, don't worry. You're right. Let's send them away, shall we? Uh, but look at this at verse 13. Verse 13. This is Jesus' response. You give them something to eat. Sorry, Lord. You give them something to eat. You're so concerned about the people. Well, you give them something to eat. Excuse me, Lord. Um, And then maybe the spokesperson that went back from Jesus and has to go to the group. And they say, did you tell Jesus about the people being hungry? I did, I did. I told Jesus about the people being hungry. And what did Jesus say? Uh, He said, "Um, you give them something to eat. Pardon? He said, you give them something to eat. And they think, classic Jesus. Always answering a question with a question. Answering a suggestion with another suggestion. Right, let's find some food. And so what they do, and we know this from the other gospel accounts, is that they go and find a young boy who's got five loaves and two fishes, his food for the day. And we see this in verse 13. He replied, you give them something to eat. And they come back finally. We only have five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. Can you hear the tone there? We have only got five loaves and two bread. Jesus, we've tried. And do you want us to go and buy food for this whole crowd? Do you really really expect us to do that, Jesus, given the time? Unless we go and buy food... What does Jesus say at this point? Because they must have been thinking, surely, if we go and tell him that we've only got five loaves and two fish, he's going to have to send the people away then. What does Jesus say this time? Verse 14. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. Excuse me, Lord? Now what are you telling us to do? Groups of 50. Lord, you do realize that we only have one of these snack packs, and that's not going to get us very, very far, is it? Anyway, verse 16. Finally, Jesus Jesus takes the food that they've given him, taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. And then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. And I want you to notice this. The miracle doesn't happen in the hands of the master. It happens in the hands of his servants, the disciples. Because Jesus takes the food, he looks up to heaven, he gives thanks, he breaks it, and then he gives it to them to give out. Now, how do you think the disciples reacted to being given half a bread roll? You done praying, Jesus? You want to to pray some more over this? No? Fine. Okay, fine. Right. This is what I think the first disciple did. Take a tiny, (laughs) and I mean tiny piece. And, you know, they went along the first person. Take a tiny piece. Take a tiny piece. Take a tiny piece. I said a tiny piece, Rosie. Don't be such a glutton. (laughs) 
But something amazing happened as they're giving the food out. The more they break it, the more there is. This doesn't describe how the miracle happens, but the more they break the bread, the more there is to give out. There's such abundance of food that it says that they all ate and were satisfied, verse 17, and that there are 12 bags of food left over, which I think is Jesus' way of saying to the disciples, I really do care about you, because they gave them all a doggy bag. And here's the thing. I know I've labored the point, and I've told it in a long way, but the question I want to ask is, is are we sometimes like the disciples? Losing sight of what Jesus miraculously offers us, and especially the satisfaction he offers. You see, for the disciples in that moment, they've noticed that there's a problem. But they think the only solution that there is, is their idea, and it's a worldly, natural one at that. Because they couldn't, it's like they couldn't see who's in front of them. We can be the same. It can be so easy. Even though we know who Jesus is, we lose sight of what he offers us and what he can miraculously provide. Don't we just end up thinking exactly like the disciples, as in we think the solution to my problems and other people's needs are the ideas that I have and the things that I make happen for my own life. And when I get those things, that's when I will be happy, and that is when I will be satisfied. And we lose sight of Jesus' satisfaction. As in, you know, when I get the right job, then I'll be really satisfied. When I make enough money, then I'll be really satisfied. And I don't know how, if you've ever done that or specified, usually it's quite a lot of money. You know, when I get this amount, when I earn this amount, when I get this much each month, oh, then I'll be happy because then I'll be comfortable. You know, I'll be really happy and satisfied when I get that magic combination of a house and a spouse. I wish I could think of a word for children that rhymed with house and spouse, but I can't. But let's add it in there. I'll be really satisfied when I get a family. If I'm really honest, at the moment for me, my version of the good life looks like playing a lot of golf. And if you know me, you'll know that I've probably spoken about that to you. And I'm just excited every time I get to play. And I've got this dream somewhere in the background about playing regularly. And I'm a member of a really nice course. I'll tell you what the dream really is. It's actually to be a chaplain uh, to a golf. That's a whole other story. Uh, I know that's a bit pathetic. The other thing we can lose sight of, as well as becoming quite focused on, well, here's what I need for my life. We can lose sight of what God has called us to do to feed and to provide for other people. What did Jesus say to his disciples that I bet took them by surprise? You feed them. You feed them. In other words, you play your part in providing for them. And the danger is that in our, as we're wrapped up in our lives, we can become quite self-centered. And we think, well, I've just got to provide for me. It's hard enough to do my own life. How on earth am I going to look out for anybody else? And I especially mean with caring, as we've spoken already about tonight, about caring for the poor, as in the kind of people that Jesus spent his time with. So we can forget about that, but also we can forget sometimes that we have what people really need. You see, people don't just need feeding, and they don't just need equality or equity, as people talk about these days. They don't just need justice. They need to know Jesus Christ. They need forgiveness for their sin. They need to know a relationship with him, and we have that message And maybe God wants to remind you tonight that true satisfaction and true joy isn't found in the material stuff of your life. It's not about the relationships you have. It's not about the stuff that you have. It's not about the status that you have. Even though, can I say, of course, all those things can be so good. You know, uh, having a family is such a blessing. Having a spouse that, you know, is godly and you're seeking God together, that's amazing. But the danger is we make those good things far too important. And we say, I will get my satisfaction when I'll be really happy is when I attain that stuff. And maybe God wants to remind you tonight that that stuff is fleeting. We don't take it into eternity with us. Only Jesus offers what will truly satisfy us. This is why the prophet Isaiah, I've quoted it already tonight, said this, and if you like, Jesus' ministry, this feeding, said this. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? And I wonder if Jesus wants to say to you tonight, through the prophet Isaiah, Jesus says to you tonight, listen, listen to me and eat what is good 
and your soul will delight in the richest affair. In other words, when you eat the good thing, you will be satisfied. And what is that good thing? Well, it's what Jesus offers us. And Jesus offers us himself. Jesus offers us himself. You see, the feeding of the 5,000 points to another meal. It doesn't just point back. It doesn't just point forward. It points to something that actually we're going to take together tonight. Let's read from verse 14. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down. And here's the, the thing I'm headed towards. Taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. And we've got the other scripture up, but I wonder if you can see it. Taking five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, giving thanks and breaking them. That parallels almost precisely the story of the Passover meal that Jesus took with his disciples, where he took bread. This is from Luke 22. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You see, as Jesus was breaking bread and fish and sharing it with the crowd, he wasn't pointing back to Moses and Elijah, although that is a confirmation of who he is. And he was pointing to himself and to his death on the cross to make a way for us to know the welcome of God, to make a way for us to know the satisfaction that God offers us. Jesus died upon a cross for our sin. And on the cross, if you like, there was another miracle of multiplication as one man's death, one perfect man's death, paid for the sin of the entire world. He paid for your sin and he paid for mine. And Jesus' body was broken and his blood was shed to welcome us home and to satisfy us with eternal life. And Jesus says to us tonight, eat what is good and you'll be satisfied. In other words, eat of me as you believe in me and as you look to me and as you treasure me above everything else in your life. When you dethrone your idols and you re me, when you eat of me, you will know joy and your soul will delight in the richest affair. You will know satisfaction. You'll know a taste of it in this life and you'll know it fully in the life to come. Hear Jesus say again to you tonight, listen, listen to me, eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Amen.